um, my own health journey. And when I was a personal trainer, and you kind of read a book by Carrie Tools, you read that, and you find out about this guy, Mark Sisson, who runs a paleo blog, and then you find out about this Swedish guy, um, <laughs> Bell, sort of like, lots of um, and then over the years, you think you know everybody, right? And then about, <laughs> only about six months ago, um, I found out about this doctor in Slough, this GP in Slough, um, who is getting incredible results with his patients um, with, through dietary interventions, type 2 diabetes. Um, and then you find out that this guy has been doing it for over a decade. It's <laughs> like, so, how did I not know about it? <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, so please welcome to the stage, Dr. <laughs> Gosh, you made me nervous already. Uh, thank you very much, Sam, for that kind introduction. And um, thank you for all coming. It's been a wonderful weekend, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. There's so much enthusiasm, positivity in this uh, conference that um, this is going to be recommended to everybody I talk to back in Slough and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Now, as Sam said, um, I've actually been... Um, in Slough uh, for a long time, and I've been practicing low carbs on my patients for well over a decade. But uh, the journey started probably about 20 years ago, eight years into my practice, when I really did not want to use insulin. It was the worst thing, but every incentive was trying to be pushed towards the GPs to try to encourage it. Training, uh, incentivization, Criticism if you're not using insulin so much as the rest of the crowd, but I fought through it. I still persisted, persisted in my stubbornness, and then as time went on, looked at GI, looked at our, uh, uh, what the, the patients were eating, and then developed uh, intuitively off my own back without any reading that carbs were the culprit. Um, this is what I want to cover. The pr uh, South Asians, prevalence, what we're achieving in our practice, how we achieved it, what the issues that we faced were, the difficulties, particularly with the patients, and how we addressed them. And um, that uh, includes motivating the change. Some very recent additions over the last uh, seven days or so, and maybe if we get time for a case example and then questions. I'm not an academic, straight away. I'm not a former researcher. I do not spend my time looking at papers, research papers. I don't write in them. I'm not a diabetologist, and I'm not a diabetic at the moment. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I've not uh, had any formal uh, accreditation or certification in uh, diabetes, and I'm not funded by the zzz companies, okay? <laughs> I am just a straightforward full-time GP who's, um, who's really passionate about his patients and diabetes is one of my several interests. I've been there in practice for 28 years. I'm an Asian background, traditional, both uh, culturally and in family life. And I've lived, ever since I've come over to the UK, which is about 53 years ago, I've actually lived in the centre of an Asian community, first in Southall and then in Slough and I've been preaching uh, low carbs to my patients for well over eight to 10 years. My practice, 10,400 patients, 90% of them from the South Asian population. 1,130 plus diabetics in my practice. That's 11% of the total practice, more than 15% of the adult population over 17 years, and up to between 45 to 48% of the over 65 years old. The diabetic team consists of me and a part-time diabetic specialist nurse. I'm part-time as well from the diabetic point of view. I probably contribute to maybe one or two sessions, whole time equivalent per week, because I would do a hell of a lot of other things down there. But despite that, we still manage results good results. 
And uh, just as a uh, uh, self-inflating uh, scenario, uh, I was a finalist in uh, 2015. Just looking at the demographics again, just less than 45% Indian background in our patients, just a little bit more than 45% Pakistani population, of which the peak incidence or the prevalence is in the 55 to 64 year old age group. The prevalence creeps up to nearly 45% in the over 65 year age group. That's how it's been over the last few years. It's steadily increased. We tend to increase our prevalent uh, numbers by about 50 to 60 every year. Now, two days ago, the day morning that I ar arrived here in Manchester, I did a quick search on EMIS, our computer system, just to look at what the number of pre-diabetics uh, pre was. And when I did that in, the, the graph on the right-hand side, the coloured one, that shoots up the prevalence up to nearly 60% in our population over the age of 70, 75. That's how common it, it, the whole problem is in our population. Now, what are the targets we aspire to? Targets we all want to achieve that we've been pushed to achieve. Good, HbA1 control, weight loss, improved lipid profiles, low cost on medications. That's what the Department of Health, the government, our CCG, and realistically, we want to achieve because of the pressures on the NHS. And do we want to reverse diabetes? Is there a cure or is it just remission? Let's see. 2010 to 2012, near the, uh, just soon after the beginning of my low carbohydrate journey, um, I did this audit, 146 patients. And I managed to achieve HbA1c reductions of up to over 60 millimoles in our, pa uh, in our patients. I repeated that audit in 2014, this time on 290 patients. And I managed to achieve over 100 millimoles reduction on dietary measures only. At the same time, reducing medications. Not discontinuing them in all the cases, but reducing them. I'd, again, thanks to David, David Unwin, for the superb uh, efforts that he's managed to put me third in the world, top in UK for the largest uh, HPA1C reduction. <laughs> HPA1C reduction from 172 down to 56 within four months on dietary measures after she had been going to the diabetic clinic, educational clinic, and not achieving anything. At the same time, what we want to do is look at weight loss and improve lipid profiles. I'm just going to give you one or so examples of each case. And uh, this was the drop in HbA1c in that patient. This was the profile of the lipids. A substantial, at, during the same period, substantial reduction in total cholesterol, substantial reduction in LDL and triglycerides, and a significant rise in HDL without medications. Another one from a few years ago, 2001, drop in weight, corresponding uh, drops in the lipid profiles, although I haven't got the slides for all of them. I don't know why this is happening. Uh, right. <laughs> Low cost. <laughs> Low cost. Slough, over the last two to three years, uh, as a CCG, has um, shone in the public eye because uh, we are achieving targets as a CCG, and we're also became, uh, being incredibly economical as far as the prescribing and the costs are concerned. We, in Slough, are in the lowest fifth, you know, naught to 300 uh, per patient per year. So 299 was the average for the locality as a whole. And um, I tend to feature, or my practice tends to feature, at, either at the top or near the top as regards achievement in HbA1c reductions, but at the same time, the lowest prescriber, 165 pounds per diabetic patient per year. That's all it is. This graph, um, uh, I know David's gone through that earlier on from his practice and full, uh, you know, regards and compliments and 
uh, to him what he's done. I've looked at the diabetics, uh, pay, uh, spend on the diabetic patients rather than just the thousand. So that's how I tend to feature down there. On the, the Dove tool everybody GP in, uh, is used to, um, it compares achievements versus cost. And yours truly, or our practice, is one of the highest achievers, but definitely the lowest spenders, right at the bottom. And that's where we featured year on year. Compared to the, the NHS England overall spend in red, this is on diabetic medications, insulin, blood glucose monitoring um, costs across the board. NHS England features over £250 per year. Ours is between 150 to 200 year on year. And this is going back to 2012. If you look at insulin prescriptions, NHS average is just over £100 per year. We feature just above £40. So 40 40th, 40% 40 of what the NHS budget is, uh, uh, expenses are. And this goes on year on year. Let's focus on what we are, want to achieve, what our targets are. We want to have the... I've done this before, haven't I? <laughs> right. OK, reversing diabetes or putting it into remission. I'm just going to choose maybe two cases only. The latest one, which was a 53-year-old Asian gentleman diagnosed in 2006. So nearly 11 years ago, HbA1c uh, at that diagnosis 9.9, .9, equivalent to 85 millimoles, I think, uh, present units, recurrent boils, strong family history, managed to get good control on metformin and pyoglitazone at the onset, but Dietary measures, difficult to st uh, stick to, so we, he got glycolicide added in later on. Then over the years, despite all the pressures, he only saw the light last year. So he wanted to control his diet suddenly. He wanted to exercise suddenly. He stopped his glycoside and the pyoglitazone and eventually uh, stopped the metformin in December 2016 and his HbA1c was 38. I think with all the discussions we're having, we think he's, he, he's actually cured. And GTT, pre-load 5, post-load 2 hours, 5.4. Yes, he is cured. However, if you look at his HbA1c, it has cracked up slightly. So I, d I don't think he's cured. You know, uh, he is in remission. And it may be that the vast majority of the patients that we feel are cured are actually in remission. Maybe that might be the right terminology. There was a patient who I diagnosed with an HbA1c of 101 on diagnosis, and within two months or three months, he managed to get his HbA1c down to below 40 on diet control only, because he was determined. That was back in, uh, was it early 2014? And he's maintained that over the years, Present time, his HbA1c is still around that same level. But his glucose tolerance test has, after a uh, year and a half, showed a post-load uh, 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 post sugar of 11. So hovering on to the impaired glucose tolerance, I haven't repeated it. He doesn't want to bother me anymore, but I know he's actually progressing very well. How have we achieved it? standard thing that we're all learning, that we all aspire to, that we all want to do. Low carbohydrate diet, lifestyle changes with exercise, mental and physical well-being, and the sleep that was truly referred to earlier on is very important. And finally, using medications. It's usually, um, patients are so different. You know, there's the determined ones like the case I've just shown you back in 2014. Then there are other who say, yes, sir, three bags full, sir. And the moment they leave the consultant's consulting room door, they say, stuff it, we're going to carry on as before. And they don't listen. Everybody's different. But it's more difficult, it's more difficult in the people who don't understand, who, don't, uh, who are not literate, who are elderly, who are set in their ways and who can't exercise as aggressively as we want them to do or regularly as we want them to do. So the other difficulties I was having was conflicting advice 
from day one, from the dietitians, the diabetic center, the diabetic specialist nurses, who we as GPs were supposed to refer to. We, didn't, we couldn't do it in-house because we didn't have the diabetic uh, dietitians in there or the specialist nurses from the local hospital. Conflicting <coughs> advice. And the way I dealt with it was by building the trust, giving the patients an option to try what I wanted them to do, and then if there's any queries to come back to me, whether it's within 24 hours, whether it's in 72 hours, whether it's in one week, or whether it's in two weeks, I would give them a relatively open door. And the open door was not to knock on my consulting <coughs> consultant uh, door, but to give me a ring. And I would deal with it over the telephone. They would monitor what their sugars are or what the issues they had, and they would speak to me. And that's the way I've continued. I've built up that trust, and uh, the patients feel a lot more comfortable with that. The other issues was patients understanding, as I said, the literacy and the elderly and accepting lifestyle changes. In the Asian culture, there is immense thing of food that is sort of established in stone. You know, trying to change that is incredibly difficult. And um, so there was a lot of reluctance on it. Then cultural and peer pressure, you know, if somebody goes out who's a diabetic and they suddenly don't want to have your parties, everybody looks at them. They think, what the hell are you doing? You know, is there something wrong? Are you ill? <laughs> uh, so the way I addressed it was addressing it with the patients in their language so that they were comfortable, they understood. I tried to talk to them in a very culturally sensitive way because that was the only way I was going to win. And I talked to them at their level. It wasn't the doctor talking down to the patients, it was a colleague, you know, on the same level. I also built up a vast tool of educational visual aids, which I used to, to uh, demonstrate to them as to what their food was doing to their blood sugar profile. All the common foods. Then I spoke to them, to the outside in the community, at the mosque, mosque at the Gurdwara, at a community centre, and I used to do that year, uh, every year, several times a year. I had to look for foods that replaced the ones that I wanted them to stop. And I feel that there are the four Ps that I resort to here. The food needs to be appealing. It needs to be practical. It needs to be palatable for them. And they need to find it acceptable. If those four Ps are not ticked off, then you're going to struggle. Okay. The biggest uh, hurdle after all that was maintaining momentum outside in the community. And this, already? Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> okay, um, right. And I did this by regularly reviewing them and, uh, and I would do that week, uh, two weekly or four, uh, three monthly or whatever. But there was still a proportion that did not uh, uh, cooperate. The research I did in two th uh, 2010, I'll just um, quickly go through it. I inquired individually from the patients what they had to eat. I then used glucose monitoring, continuous glucose monitoring to build up the relevant profiles of the, uh, of the foods. I used those as pictorial aids to demonstrate to the patients what alternative foods they can have. And I've collated the effects of the change on the blood sugar profiles of the different foods. And I did that for 150 patients in 2010 to 12, and I did the research on the 290 in 2014. These are the common foods, okay? Breakfast time. Toast, or, uh, most of it very common across the board. Chapatis and parottas, if anybody doesn't know chapatis, they are full of flour, they're on to a hot pan, there's a picture down there, and parottas are almost double what the, each, uh, each uh, uh, chapati is, but it's got a lot more oil of ghee in there, so fat. Uh, lunchtime, same sort of thing, but also the sandwiches and the potatoes. The ones in red, and nighttime, again, chapatis, sandwiches, pizzas, naans, pita breads, etc. All, it's not too dissimilar to what the Caucasians have, okay, the, across the board. Now, key findings. Traditional Asian foods, very, very high carbohydrate in content, large rise with all the starchy foods and the common foods that they were having. 
they also had minim minimizing carbohydrate intake was quite easily the best way to control uh, the diet and the control of the sugar. The other curious thing, and this is probably one of the most important things that I found, was that the same meal in the evening, which invariably was the heavier meal, but if it was the equivalent meal lunchtime and evening, the same meal in the evening had a much, much, much more prolonged effect on the blood sugar. And that itself is the key thing. You've got to have a light meal at night time. Um, walking itself after a meal was very successful in maintaining the sugar down. Significantly reduced peaks when on those profiles with the oils, the fats, and the yogurt, and the milk addition to the meal. Crela, if anybody know, everybody knows, is uh, bitter gourd. It's a vegetable. It's used in the Asian community quite a lot. Excellent. Mixing the different flours made a, diff uh, a big impact on, uh, on the sugar profiles. Adding in fats and protein to the meals made a big impact on their GI content, so it's reducing the peaks. Vodka didn't make anything, okay? <laughs> so uh, uh, the morning, the other thing I noticed is I, I questioned whether the GTT was always the right uh, tool for diagnosis. You know, you <laughs> saw a big peak in the center, and the HbA1c may, may be slightly raised, but the GTT doesn't necessarily show the tool, true picture. And I believe that you need to have a combination. You need to use all three parameters in the uncertain cases. GTT, HbA1c, and fasting. Right. This is fairly established. The last point, and David uh, pointed that earlier on, it's got to be re reproducible. And this is reproducible. I've done it year on year. These are the kind of foods that I looked at the profiles and I've built up the resource and this is what I use to educate the patients or convince them. I'll just give you an example very quickly now. Uh, the most commonest um, uh, is chapatis, the culprit in the Asian com community. And you can use different flowers in order to provide a better profile. You know, it's no good saying cut this out, cut that out, because the majority will not necessarily do it. There's a proportion who will be very um, uh, vigilant about it and they will not touch chapatis, but the majority of the others, particularly the elderly, will need something like that because you won't get the, the buy-in for it. So you try to think about alternatives. I say to them, your normal chapatis in a diabetic patient can raise the blood sugar up like this. This is a diabetic patient. However, if you change your food, the same vegetable curries, but you change the flour of your chapatis and you cut out the potatoes, that is the kind of result that you can get. Okay? Which one would you have? And you know, the answer is really obvious. Other people, myths. We, we talked about myths. In the Asian community, there's a myth that corn flour is better for your sugar. It isn't. This is corn flour chapati. It's thicker. It does the same thing. Eating veg uh, just um, uh, three chapatis at night time, I show them this, showing them the rise goes on up to about 5 o'clock in the morning. Prolonged. If, however, you change the flour and you cut out the potatoes, you can get flat profiles. If you have a vegetable curry with your chapatis, the peak will be higher. That's in red. But if you have a meat curry with your chapatis, the peak will be lower. These are the kind of things I show them. And um, if you have no chapatis... <laughs> okay. Now, the first question that they say is, Doc, what am I going to eat if there's no chapatis? You know, they've lived the whole life, 70, 80 year olds on chapatis. So I suggest that. I said, uh, what do you think of this? Mm -hmm. Is it appetizing? Do you think you can get your full and their eyes open? They said, oh, it's colorful. It's really nice. I said, well, this is what you do. You fill up your plate with salad chopped up almost like rice in that sense. You don't need to go for cauliflower if you don't want to. But you add in the other stuff and then you eat it. It's tasteful. I've been doing it for about six years at home. I don't have chapatis as hardly ever at home. And this is very appetizing. 
Or you can have the alternatives. If you're vegetarian, you can just have your lentils and your vegetable curry. And I'll give them these examples to go through. The second biggest issue is bread. And, uh, you know, David actually um, uh, pointed that out and everybody else is. So what it, what's the alternatives to bread? The top line is cheese, egg, toast. Second one is uh, cheese, ham, tomato, sandwich. But this one using linseed and in the, uh, those days, soya bread, which was a lower uh, GI. And there is a difference. We don't want to push soya anymore, but there is a difference. And the last one was salad. And I said, which profile would you have, want to have? So those are the kind of uh, uh, what's it, diagrams I show. And if they're, if they're completely vegetarian, they can always have vegetable sausages and salad. Whole meal causes a rise. Uh, no bread doesn't cause a rise. Then we looked at breakfast. Toast causes a rise. Croissants cause a rise. Bagels cause a rise. Linseed <coughs> soya bread still causes a rise, but it's not so bad. That's the, the comparisons I show. And I choose these diagrams to what they have told me that they're eating generally. So it, it's, it's individual, so I can make the impact. Then everybody believes that porridge is healthy. And I tell them, yes, if you're not a diabetic. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, porridge, Weetabix, and all those sort of things, they do cause a significant rise. Now, I'm just going to show you this as an alternative uh, uh, to bread. And uh, we've got Jerry Davis, who's the founder and, uh, uh, of uh, Fiber Flour. Is Jerry around here or is he outside? Jerry, stand up. Jerry, as you know, he produces uh, Fiber Flour and uh, he sent me samples and I've used them at home, made the bread. Uh, there are four, four particular, um, and this is my version, although I'm not a dab hand at making bread. Thanks very much, Jerry. Um, on the right is soda bread in a diabetic. You can see the profile at the base, one hour and two hours, just shooting up. The second one on the right is normal Hovis bread, diabetic eating it. Shh. Peaks at one hour, it starts to come down. The ones on the left-hand side, both of those are made with fiber flour at home and practice on the same diabetic patient. The rise is minimal compared to the others and it comes down very quickly within the two hours. That's the sort of thing that we need to produce and I, would, I know Jerry's going to be working on that. Um, I'll just show you this uh, diagram because there is... Uh, was it recommendations about bread being made just with uh, coconut and seeds without any flour? The one in the middle on the left hand side, not, not, uh, not the far one, that is made with no flour and it's absolutely brilliant on the sugar profile, but I think it's going to be difficult to eat regularly. <laughs> yeah, okay, so. Crela is the other one, bitter gourd, if anybody is not convinced about its effects. This is the vegetable. This is pita bread and curry showing the profile peaking up for about a couple of hours. But if you add in corella uh, and um, uh, either as a, as a vegetable with in the whole thing or even as uh, with salad, this is the kind of profile it will produce. A lot, lot flatter. So it improves the, pro uh, the, the overall control. Chicken, corella, but no ch uh, chapatis is absolutely flat. Pizzas, sun Friday evenings, everybody get together, go out to Pizza Hut, a diabetic patient eating at 10.30 at night time. You want to see the results? <laughs> up, up and away until 5 o'clock in the morning. I show them that if they tell me that they do have pizzas and I, I, I'm hoping they never touch the stuff again. Okay, potatoes, I think we've been through. Um, tuna and salad, we've been through. Protest. And night time, the prolonged. I think I've shown you a few examples, but I'll just give you this comparison-wise. Protest are the thicker chapatis with a bit of oil in it. It's very satisfying. It keeps you full up. It's supposed to be eaten in the morning, so you've got the full day of sustenance, and it used to be used in India when the farmers used to go out for their long days. Now... What happens if you eat it at night time? This is in the morning, 
Same patient at night time, but slightly reduced, uh, uh, the flower was slightly changed. It still goes on rising up to about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Effects of protein addition and meat and fat. Looking at plain flour prata is in, the, uh, is in the red. That's the peak. The next day he had uh, minced meat. So there's a little bit of oil, there's protein in there, and the peaks go down. Yeah. That's the kind of uh, what's it, uh, graphs I use to convince them. Walking. This is interesting. This, Weetabix peaks it. The gentleman goes for a walk for half an hour, and you can see the drop. He's a really nice elderly husband to his wife because he then does the vacuuming when he comes home. And there's another drop, okay? The next day, he does the snow clearing after his breakfast, an hour later. You can see the drop, and he keeps himself fit, so he does the exercise, there's a further drop afterwards. But this was in even more dramatic. A middle-aged gentleman who had what we call chana and putura. Again, this is flour, but it's, uh, it's fried, and it's uh, the chickpea uh, curry that they have. He was filling himself up at lunchtime at about 2 o'clock, and this is his profile when he sat at home, up to about 5 o'clock. The next time, I told him to walk straight away, so he walked for an hour and a half. That's the same patient, roughly the same time, the same sort of food. It happens with the non-diabetics. Exercise, exercise, and the nighttime profile for the impaired glucose tolerance, the pre-diabetics. This is three or four chapatis at nighttime with potatoes, and the sugar is raised between just um, from about 9.30 up to about 3 o'clock in the morning. If he changes the flour, it's a lower peak, lower rise. If he misses out the chapatis with the same sort of curry, pulling, that's how flat he can get it. Exercise, mental re relaxation, I've mentioned. Elderly population, significant number who sit at home and haven't got anything better to do. So four years ago, I started a voluntary sponsored program at the local sports center, which is about 300 yards away from our practice. Opening it up, free admission for all the elderly over 50. And uh, I used to uh, pay the trainers for two hours every day, four days a week. And they did yoga, they did exercises, chair yoga that we mentioned earlier on, etc. They had uh, Zumba for them, you know, Pilates and Tai Chi, etc. And this is the kind of, it helps, it lifts them up. You see them doing this and it lifts you up just watching them. And this is the kind of responses of satisfaction with their feeling happy, feeling uh, the, the aches and pains and the breathing and the sleeping all improving. Thank you. Okay, five minutes. Uh, all right. Right. The other pictorial tools that I use as has happened over the last six months, and that's primarily because of David's introduction to, uh, to hair for me and every, all the information that's going on and to doc, uh, uh, Diet Doctor uh, is... First one, I use a, this as a graph of all the 1,100 patients with their HbA1c. And if they're poorly controlled, I ask them, where do you think you're sitting? On the right-hand side, the, the worst, the poorest, you know, the control, and the one likely to be complications, or on the left-hand side. And, uh, you know, it, it's a good introduction. Then it opens their eyes. Then I use what David uh, you, uh, has actually put down. Excellent, excellent infographics tools to use to convince them to change their food. I also use this. This is incredibly dramatic, you know. I asked them, I said, well, what do you think? Which one would you want to choose? Everybody had said the left-hand side except for one person. They said, oh, I'll use the bread. It's quicker to eat. <laughs> okay. Fiber flour. This is uh, uh, just um, um, uh, the packaging. When I came here on Friday, <laughs> I put a continuous blood sugar monitoring machine on. And that is what 
the peak was with two slices of bread for me. Okay? I'm getting pretty worried about it. But when I came here, um, sorry, that was the day before I came here, at lunchtime. But in the evening, I used fibre flour for two chapatis. And you can see the small peak on the right-hand side. That's the kind of dramatic difference that the flour, low carbohydrate, can produce. The following day, the one on the right is two chapatis whole meal. Okay? Big difference from the first one. I, I don't know where the slides are. You can see, can't you? I won't talk to you. Sure. And this is um, congratulations to the food that they supplied down here. <laughs> Pretty flat, huh? <laughs> okay, what do I recommend? Just very quickly then. Uh, minimize chapatis, breads, rice, potatoes, 30 minutes exercise after a meal, and it can be just fast walking, and uh, light meals, minimal carbohydrates at night time. And uh, I tend to review the diet at every consultation. I ask them for a pre-perennial blood sugar chart if I'm seeing them after a long time. I don't ask for the post. Okay, I, I advise them on their exercises, remind them about their walking, etc. at every consultation, and uh, I suggest the uh, dietary changes bit by bit, depending on what they're eating, at every consultation with the pictorial tools. And um, what I would do is, if they're really badly controlled, I see them after a week or make contact after a week. If they're a little bit better after two weeks, then I spread it at down to about every three to six months. And that's the reason how I've achieved it. Um, this was the case example, and this is the only change that this gentleman made back in 2014. He was eating porridge in the morning, sandwich at lunchtime, fruit, and then four chapatis. I asked him to change his diet to maintaining his oats, but what he learned to do was making them a little bit raw. Uh, I, he didn't actually uh, cook them or anything like that, but uh, had them with yogurt or anything like that. Salads at lunchtime and salad in the evening. Cut out the chapatis, and this is the profile that he has achieved within two to three months and maintained over the last three years. Now, at the same time, the weight was dropped, and is, uh, I've gone through the GTT. So that's the summary, and I don't need to say anything more. These are the tools that I also tend to encourage them. If they uh, show them the, the pictures from Diet Doctor, and also, if they're wanting to lose weight, reinforce them with this slide, which is um, on the website, PHC website. Um, lifestyle with type 2 diabetes does achieve results. Thank you.